So you take the Archer Highway, go to the Lyman Church and turn there, then take the dirt road about another mile until it splits and turn left down the dead end lane. Those were the directions we gave everybody who was coming to the house that I grew up in from town. Here's a picture on a map that highlights where I grew up in the yellow house here. I never got asked to go borrow a cup of neighbor from the, or a cup of sugar from the neighbors or borrow an egg. It was about a mile away to the neighbor's house and they were my cousins. <laughs> so uh, my dad, in addition to working at the potato processing plant in town, he farmed. We had about 100 acres of crops and about 50 head of beef cattle and we had a dog or two and a cat or two and uh, we had a few horses and then some pasture land out to Roberts where we put the cows for the summer. And uh, it was always my impression that we didn't make a lot of money on the farm but dad did it anyway. And my brothers and I, as best we could, we worked to help him. Now, uh, honestly, I resented the work at times. I knew my friends in town were not working like I was working on the farm. There was a principle though, and it was seldom said, but always kind of implied, that learning to work hard on the farm would benefit me and my brothers and the other kids in the country while the kids in town were slipping their quarters into the video games at the Big Apple Arcade. But something happened to me this past spring that really caused me to rethink this notion of how important learning to work hard on the farm was. And what happened is I overheard my wife telling someone else that Brad learned to work hard on the farm. And as I heard those words, I had this stream of consciousness where all of these images came back and it really caused me to question this notion. So let me tell you about that. Uh, most of the work on the farm revolved around the cows. We were either feeding the cows, chasing the cows, hauling the cows, doctoring the cows, or growing and harvesting the food for the cows. And whenever anything went wrong with one of the cows, dad dropped everything and took every measure possible to try to make sure things were right. Like, my brother and I remember the times early in the morning when he would come crashing into the house with a calf, just like this one, in his arms. It had been born early or born on a cold, slushy morning, and he was running it to the bathtub, our only bathtub, to heat it up with the warm water, despite my mom's vain protests. <laughs> or there was the time when the Teton Dam broke and the cows were already out to Roberts at pasture, and my dad decided to go out there so he could oversee them in case the water got too high. Now, I wasn't sure what the plan was if the water did get too high for either the cows or my dad, but there was no question that that's where he needed to be. And then there was a time when a newborn calf, a calf was being born, and the delivery was really rough. The calf was stuck. We all jumped in and tried to help pull it. It was a first-time mother, and the calf was coming with its back feet first instead of its front feet first. When we finally got it out and the calf hit the ground, he wasn't breathing. My dad immediately dropped down to his knees and started giving the calf mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation to try to save it. As I thought about these experiences, I realized that my dad didn't do these extraordinary things because he was working hard. He did these extraordinary things because he cared. And, you know, caring is not just a matter of working hard. It's a matter of making the tough decisions and doing the things that we need to do to make a difference. There was a tall, thin engineer in the late 1930s who made a decision to care. His name was Vannevar Bush, and he decided to care about developing military technologies. You see, he had learned firsthand by working as a, as a volunteer engineer at a submarine research yard in, during World War I how difficult it was to develop these new technologies in the military. And he saw the growing fascist regimes in Europe and in Asia and got concerned and decided he needed to do something about it. So to complicate things even more, in 1936, government spending for military research was slashed to almost nothing. So Vannevar Bush, despite having climbed to great academic ranks at MIT, decided to challenge political and military norms and give up a chance to be the president at MIT and instead tried to operationalize science and develop technologies that could defeat uh, fascist Germany, Nazi Germany. So he went to these extraordinary measures and arranged a meeting in the White House, in the Oval Office, with President Franklin Roosevelt on June 12th, 1940, at 4.30 p.m. The meeting lasted a mere 15 minutes. 
He took a single sheet of paper and had four paragraphs on it, and he proposed to the president establishing an office of science and technology research that reported directly to him. Roosevelt agreed, and Bush was off. He took off trying to develop these technologies, and one of the first things he did is he took some British technology for microwave radar, and he used it to help prevent the German blockade of England. You see, in 1942, Germany had sunk 7.8 million tons of Allied cargo with their U-boat submarines. And uh, Vannevar Bush's outfit just determined how to use this microwave radar and equip it on the Air Force bombers so that they could see and attack the submarines in a more efficient way. So that in May of 1943, they took out more of the German subs than had been done in any of the previous three years of the war. Besides that, Vannevar Bush's uh, uh, operation and labs did a bunch of medical research and really took control of a number of infectious diseases through the things that they did with penicillin and the research they did on malaria and tetanus. And they saved thousands of lives for battlefield soldiers through new methods of blood plasma transfusions. Because Vannevar Bush cared, he started new pathways of science and technology, but he also changed the direction of a war and he changed the world. The, US appropriate, or the United States Congress uh, House Appropriations Committee made a statement in 1945 that without Vannevar Bush's uh, Office of Scientific Research Development, that the war would not have be, been ended in a victory. So whether it's in a dirt road in Idaho or Vannevar Bush's uh, research engineering labs, caring is what makes the difference. Caring can also make a difference for other individuals around us. Take, for example, this English teacher at Weaver College. His name is Aaron Tracy. 98 years ago, he reached out to a young man who was down on his luck and encouraged him to enroll in school. This young man grew up in Weaver County. He uh, lived in a rural part of the county, and he had had aspirations to pursue a career in agriculture, but because of some of the difficulties that arose on his family's farm, that wasn't going to be a possibility for him, even though he had great acumen in growing lettuce and sugar beets and raising sheep. So Professor Tracy encouraged him to pursue a different career choice by going to school. And then he cared enough to make that choice possible. He helped the young man get a job on campus and allowed him to tutor other students after class so that he could pay for his college education. This young man had a great first year at Weaver College, and he went on and had, uh, got elected as the student body president his second year there. He graduated, went on to get his bachelor's degree at the University of Utah, and then he and his wife headed across the country to Washington, D.C., where, where they started a root beer shop and uh, a hot shop restaurant. Uh, if you've read the screen behind me and seen his name, you've already figured out how the story ends, because J. Willard Marriott's company you know, grew to be one of the largest hospitality companies in the world with over 7,000 properties and 200,000 employees. All started because of a faculty member who cared. And then, you know, sometimes we have to care about ourselves. The student in the middle of this picture who graduated from Weber State University this past spring is named Nyad Davis. Nyad decided to care and come back to school and create a better future for herself. She was a college dropout and spent eight years in a dead-end customer service job, but she decided that despite what had caused her to drop out of school before, which was a degenerative eye disease that causes her to be legally blind, she would go back and she would figure out how to graduate with a bachelor's degree in accounting. She'd figure out how to do the internships that she would need to prove to people in the professional world that despite her sight limitations, she could do the professional work. And then she would figure out how to land a high-level clearance job at the Defense Department of the United States. So what is in front of you? The next opportunity to care and change your work, the, our world, the life of someone around you, or your own life is right in front of you. Can you see it? Nyad saw hers, and I hope you all can too. Thank you very much.